I mean, I I'll press the record button. There we go. Um, welcome, everybody. Um, I want to give everyone a very warm welcome to the 2020 meeting of the American Society of Comparative Law. Uh, I'm Jennifer Manukin, and I have the good luck of being dean uh, here at UCLA School of Law. And we're really just delighted to be able to serve as the hosts of this annual summit, which, of course, as you all know, brings together the leading scholars and experts in the field um, this year virtually, um, as, as so much is happening um, virtually and online. Uh, before I continue, I would like to acknowledge that UCLA sits on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tonkwa peoples. As a land-grant institution, we pay our respects to the ancestors, elders, and relatives, past, present, and emerging. Uh, I'm truly sorry that uh, we can't gather in person. But I'm also delighted that we're able to gather in this uh, virtual modality via Zoom. Um, and we're expecting uh, over the course of these conversations around 400 people from six continents. Uh, that breadth should obviously come as no surprise. Uh, comparative law and the deep understanding of the relative laws of nations and their connections to one another has, uh, I think, rarely been more per pertinent than it is right now. Um, the COVID-19 crisis uh, is obviously just one of many issues whose challenges and I hope potential solutions will span the globe. Um, and so in moments like these, the recognition of the incredible importance of thinking comparatively and thinking globally uh, is I think front and center uh, for, for all of us. And I fully expect that everyone uh, who engages in um, some of these conferences, 26 panels uh, will come away with a deeper understanding of, of um, both the critical importance of uh, comparative law and uh, with a greater um, sense of some of the, the challenges, opportunities, analytic moves, um, what's intellectually exciting in the field and so much else. Um, here at UCLA Law School, uh, international and comparative law are, is an area of tremendous importance to us. We've been building further in this area over the last few years, and we've seen significant growth, um, both in our international and comparative law programs, as well as through our Promise Institute for Human Rights. I'm especially proud of our, of our truly excellent faculty, uh, a number of whom are participating uh, in this conference, um, as well as our students who can opt to specialize in international and comparative law, and a number do. Um, so when I say that it's a matter of great pride for us to be hosting this event, uh, I very much mean it. Um, and, uh, you know, for us on, on, on the West Coast, situated as we are, uh, the chance to have all of you from six continents uh, participating across time zones um, is really, you know, it's a, it's, it's a real pleasure for us. And I'm, I'm delighted we're able to do this. I do want to give just a couple of quick thank yous. Uh, I very much want to thank uh, our organizer, Maximo Longer, uh, uh, who's put a lot into um, making this, this happen. Uh, I want to thank our International Comparative Law Program, our Transnational Program on Criminal Justice. And I want to thank the, the numerous UCLA Law School staff um, who have worked to make this, uh, this possible. I, I want to give my very sincere thanks um, to them. I also want to thank the American Society of Comparative Law's president, uh, Professor Rick Kay, and all of the officials and members of the society uh, for their support. Um, thank you for joining both this morning and this event. Um, I hope uh, I, I, I hope that the fact that you know nobody had to get on on airplanes to be here is um, small solace. Um, I know that there are things that are lost uh, when we can't do this in person and can't have the hallway conversations and can't have those serendipitous connections. But I'm also really glad that we get to have the substance and the intellectual content and the incredible um, work and showcase uh, for for all that you are. Um, that you are thinking and studying and focusing on. So thank you for joining this week. Uh, I hope it's a terrific conference and I'd like to turn things over uh, to Professor and President Rick Kay. Thank you very much, Dean Manukin. Uh, good morning or good evening or good afternoon as the case may be. Uh, I wanna thank Dean Manukin and the UCLA Law School for virtually uh, hosting our meeting. Uh, this kind of meeting is uh, of course, something new uh, for the American Society of Comparative Laws. It's new for many of us in, in many different situations. 
Uh, and it has, as, as you've already heard, seen uh, some distinct advantages. Um, it's an economical way to run a meeting. No lodging costs, no travel costs, no expenditure of time in, in travel. Uh, and therefore, we have, as Dean Manukin said, many more people who have registered, uh, close to 400 registrants. Um, and that means, most importantly for us, uh, that we will have many, many more chances to spotlight uh, and critically examine many more comparative law subjects. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this program, uh, putting it online, has its own challenges. Um, as I said, though, we've never tried to organize a conference like this as an online enterprise. Uh, and frankly, uh, we needed help. We needed the technical assistance uh, that was beyond the ability um, even of our uh, very capable program planners. So I want to also thank the UCLA Law School, uh, the Transnational Program on Criminal Justice, uh, and the International Law Program. Um, their help, uh, and it's, it's not just token help, it has been real human intelligence and labor uh, has made this event possible, uh, and we are very grateful to them. Um, I also uh, want to note, however, that we are fortunate, as we are fortunate every year, to have the work of our own annual program committee. Uh, Afra Sharapur this year, Padida Alai, Hannah Buxbaum, uh, Fernanda Nicola, uh, and Julia Shim. Um, but most of all, uh, the chair of the annual program committee uh, and our vice president, Maximo Lam. Uh, Maximo has done an amazing job in organizing and, and implementing this um, sensational um, and uh, he has shown himself to be a real master uh, of turning lemons into lemonade. We have a program uh, that is more extensive, also deeper and richer uh, than any program we have ever had. Um, so we're going to look on the bright side, uh, even though we all hope to see each other in person uh, at the next uh, comparative law meeting in 2021. Happy to welcome everyone who is here to participate uh, in this event. I wish all of you uh, an interesting, uh, enjoyable, and profitable two days. Thanks very much. Um, thank you, Dean Nukin and um, and uh, President Kay for for those uh, for those presentations. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I am Maximo Langer. Uh, I am the chair of the annual program committee of the American Society of Comparative Law. Uh, and uh, I am delighted to have you all uh, here. I just, since we are in, in remote uh, mode, I just want to take um, advantage to thank all the people who have contributed to um, this, uh, to putting together this event. Uh, it's really been a group effort. Uh, let me start by thinking uh, Anna de Robiland uh, from Boston University and um, Claudia Haupt and Margaret Wu from Northeastern University. This was supposed to be an in-person meeting in Boston University. There was going to be a part of, with our younger comparativist committee that was going to take place in Northeastern uh, Law School. And because of COVID, like many other things, we had to cancel those plans, we had to rearrange, and this is why we ended up having uh, this uh, uh, virtual meeting uh, at UCLA uh, this uh, this year, but I really want to thank them, especially uh, Professor Di Robiland, who proposed initially this topic of comparative legal history, and so we are in, in that way realizing her, her vision. Uh, second, uh, at UCLA, let me thank um, uh, several people that have participated and contributed to, to put this conference together. Uh, as usual, Dean Nukin for all her support for this event and everything else. Jessica Pick, uh, director of our International Comparative Law Program, Sherry Yuan, also from that program, Wei John, uh, our um, events uh, coordinator here at UCLA, with Wade Carney, David Capoli, Thomas Price, uh, Renea Tornatore, Harry Hawke, and Jessica Sonley. Thank you all of them for uh, uh, working in putting this together. 
And let me also thank a number of people at the society, at the American Society of Comparative Law, who have also been central in putting the, the program together, including our president, Rick Kay, Ron Scalise, Sally Richardson, Frank Geburts, Christina Roux, our executive assistant, uh, and then the members of the program committee that uh, Professor Kay already mentioned. I am truly thankful to all of them. Second point, I want just to make a couple of announcements again, because there won't be another time in the program, and so I, I need to take advantage of, of this opportunity now. Um, a UCLA announcement is that our Journal of International Law and Foreign Affairs is putting together a symposium on international human rights and corporate accountability. Uh, there is a call for, for paper proposals, uh, and the um, the deadline for it is October the 24th. Uh, you just have to submit an abstract for it. If you are interested in it, you know, uh, contact GILFA, you know, our journal, or write to the organization of the annual meeting, and we'd be glad to send you the uh, call for papers. Also, the other announcement has to do with the society, and, and it is that our comparative law work in progress workshop, which is a, a mid of the year workshop that we have been holding for over 10 years, right? A small, very substantive meeting, competitive uh, in terms of, you know, only a few papers can be selected, run by, by Jackie Ross, uh, Kim Shepley, uh, and Jack DeLille, uh, will be taking place uh, in the academic year 2020-2021. Uh, the, the call for papers is coming uh, uh, very, very soon. Uh, and now, you know, let's, let's move uh, to the meeting. This is a first in many ways, uh, as, as President Kay was saying. Uh, and so, of course, it's our first uh, online meeting. Uh, it's been challenging to put it together, uh, but I'm truly looking forward to uh, these uh, two days of, you know, 26 panels with over 10, uh, 100 speakers from over 20 countries. Uh, for, uh, for, uh, 400 people registered right from the six continents. Uh, it's promise, it promises to be a, a fascinating uh, conference. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Stuart Banner, who is going to be chairing our first uh, plenary uh, panel. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, thanks, Maximo. Uh, welcome to the first plenary panel on the, um, the relationship between comparative law and legal history. Uh, we've got a, uh, an all-star uh, panel of speakers, including Helga Dedek from McGill, uh, Cheryl Lee Munchie from Georgetown, Tamar Herzog from Harvard, and Jim Whitman from Yale. Uh, we've asked our speakers if they could limit themselves to uh, 15 minutes each, and then that will allow uh, about a half an hour for discussion and questions. And the way, the way to uh, 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 ask a question uh, or to, or to or to say anything really is to is to use the chat function, and then I will uh, uh, do my best to to read uh, your question or your comment aloud to the uh, to the panelists. Uh, so let's get uh, uh, get started uh, straight away. First up is uh, uh, Helga Dedek. Well, uh, thank you so much, Stuart, for the introduction, and uh, and of course, uh, thank you very much, everybody, for this kind invitation. It is. A great honor indeed to participate in this in this opening plenary panel and uh, what what an exciting panel it is indeed an all star panel Stuart um, so thank you again so the relationship between comparative law and, and history um, let's look at one description of this relationship uh, offered by a practitioner of comparative law the foremost object of comparative law we learn here is to, and I quote, to aim at discovering the principles regulating the development of legal systems with a view to explain the origin of institutions and study the conditions of life. Such a study of the evolution of law must be by its very nature, both historical and comparative. Since evolution involves the idea of sequence, while the basis of any scientific induction is dependent on the comparison of kindred processes. Uh, the language gives it away, of course. This excerpt is quite exactly 100 years old, taken from the inaugural lecture given by James D. Montmorency on the occasion of his accession to the Quain Professorship of Comparative Law in London. Here, in 1920, the speaker reaches even further back into the long 19th century by quoting Oxford professor Paul Vinogradov, who himself was dubbed by his biographer the pontiff of comparative law, 
who was, however, by training a medievalist. So this strong version of identifying comparative law with comparative history represents, of course, just one idiosyncratic phase in the disciplinary self-reflection of comparative law. However, this illustrates how the perception of law, history, and comparison and their complicated relationships have fluctuated over time. At times, and from certain disciplinary angles, maybe it might look as if it were the relationship between law and history that's difficult. But uh, since we're here among legal historians, uh, we don't need to delve into these issues. Um, Rather, I would like to look at some of these fluctuations over time specifically with respect to comparison and start from the fact that in both our mother disciplines in law and in history, the comparative method has recently been subject to a serious challenge, the challenge of transnationalism. American historian Michael Seigel, reflecting on the future of comparative history after the transnational turn, opined that comparison serves as a better subject than method. Well, let's try this out and see whether historicizing comparison itself might have something to contribute here. The transnational turn was a response to the uneasy feeling that traditional theoretical frameworks were inadequate for the study of the global transformation of modernity as Beck called it. Both in law and in history, the comparative subdisciplines seem to face the same issues. First, a methodological nationalism that made the nation state the foremost reference point of comparison. And second, an entrenched Western bias that hadn't fully freed itself from its colonial gaze. Comparison seemed hopelessly locked in a static Westphalian framework. There were a lot of truths to this criticism. Unsurprisingly, given the development of the comparative disciplines as subdivisions of their respective mother disciplines, the intellectual reflection on both history and law obvious, obviously have their own long histories, but only in the 19th century, the university in the Western world came into its modern form and developed the modern concept of disciplinarity. The learning and the law taught at European universities for centuries with now under pressure to justify its presence in the modern university and turn to a scientific, quote unquote, treatment of the positive law of the nation state. History, a newcomer to the classic curriculum, came into its own within a firm methodological framework of national historicism. Therefore, it was, at least as envisioned by scholars like Ranke and Droysen, and despite the general popularity of the comparative method in the 19th century, avowedly uncomparative. Now against this backdrop, we see that a call specifically for comparative history was indeed a critical project, an earlier attempt to escape from the methodological nationalism of the day. The most famous expression of this agenda is the manifesto by the uh, great Mark Bloch, uh, Pour une histoire européenne from 1928. It combined an agenda of a historical perspective of longue durée with the scientific method of comparison. If this sounds familiar, that is not by accident. Bloch here draws on his fellow medievalist Vinogradov, the Oxford law professor. Bloch invoked comparison as a methodological antidote against finding instances of national exceptionalism and to enable communication across national borders, putting an end to what he called the dialogue among the deaf. At this time, it was, of course, the trauma of World War I that had put in perspective the nationalism and imperialism that had preceded the conflict. Comparison now seemed one possible gateway for mutual understanding. Oxford comparatist Robert Warden Lee at the time, Dean of Law at McGill had already said this in 1916 about legal studies. We cannot, he said, above all at the present time, study law too comparatively or comparative law too much. The pages of these signs are leaves from the tree of life that are for the healing of the nations. So beautiful words, beautiful sentiment, but of course also a stark contrast to the ways in which we see comparison employed before in the years leading up to the catastrophe of World War I. The more 
technical form of legal comparison, comparative legislation, had been a tool used for better lawmaking as a feat of social engineering, very much like the exhibits of mechanical engineering put on display in the world fairs meant to do the competing nations proud. In an age of propelling colonial ambitions with feverish fervor, colonial governance regimes were compared in the hopes of learning from the other colonizers and of avoiding their mistakes. Yet even the branch of comparative law scholarship that, as we've heard at the beginning, was interested in the historical comparison of long-term processes of development was deeply entangled with the colonial project. The fascination with evolution had not only engendered a historical, but also an ethnological bent. Those both interests came together under a philosophy of history that saw contemporaneous non-European cultures as representations of Europe's past in search of general laws governing legal institutional development, ethno-legal comparatives therefore began to be fascinated with the legalities of so-called less developed or primitive peoples. Now, this research had obvious intersections with the concrete interests of colonial administrators and policymakers. Therefore, the entanglement would at times take the shape of very concrete personal involvement. For example, in the case of German legal scholar Joseph Kohler. Kohler was a comparatist and proponent of a neo-Hegelian version of universal legal history. He won the support of the Reichskolonialamt, the Imperial Colonial Office, for a large-scale research project based on the dissemination of questionnaires in the German colonies. In his application letters, Kohler's had praised the potential practical use for colonial governance and also put the right buttons of German national insecurity by stating that the French had successfully undertaken similar projects. However, even in the absence of such immediate collusion, the connection to the colonial project was a pervasive connection of mindset and epistemology. Now, such a connection is quite obvious when you look at the crude theories that provided comparatists of many disciplines at the time with their units of comparison, social Darwinism, for example, and especially the rampant pseudoscience that constructed race as a biological category, justifying an ideology of European supremacy and thus the European colonial mission. At the same time, the comparative method gained popularity across the developing canon of disciplines from linguistics and law to sociology and anthropology. Now, this is all well known, but what still seems underappreciated to me in this context, um, at least in comparative law discourse, other disciplines, especially comparative literature has done more work in this respect, is the role of comparison itself, uh, which is often as a method perceived as something neutral, almost as if it didn't have its own intellectual history. But it is not just coincidence that these sciences and pseudosciences were combined with the comparative method. A worldview intent on creating hierarchies between more or less advanced nations, between more or less developed civilizations, or between, according to whatever perverse standards, more or less evolved races, necessarily has to be obsessed with comparison. Now, scholars of post and decolonial studies know this well, of course, and have worked extensively for decades on the ways in which the concepts and the language that still dominate how we see the world originate in a colonial matrix. Uh, Walter Mignoli, for example, has famously expressed since more than 20 years, time and again, that the very project of colonialism necessitates inescapably a worldview structured by a colonial difference, which must and can only be established through comparison. In a now classical exposition, uh, Frantz Fanon, for example, explained thus the perfidious dialectics of inclusion and exclusion by comparison. Western standards are first universalized through an assumption of commensurability, only to be applied to the other with the inevitable outcome of a lesser than. 
This brings us back to the present and to the possible implications for responses to the methodological challenge that was our starting point. The late Patrick Glenn was among those who sensed that in comparative law, we should not only rethink what we are comparing, you might remember his penchant for tradition, but also rethink comparison itself. You may recall that he proposed the notion of comparing, of a bringing together of peers as an epistemology of conciliation. As an example, he drew on what he called comparative law in action and named the way in which Canadian courts had brought together Western and indigenous legalities in acknowledging Aboriginal land rights and native title. But as much as Professor Glenn's intentions were noble and his optimism genuine, this particular choice of example also epitomizes how even a progressive vision of comparison can miss the colonial dynamics of the very process of comparing itself. That in order to make indigenous ways of relating to land commensurable to Western concepts of law, they are forced to be expressed in a Western liberal epistemological matrix of rights, property, and sovereignty. And it is exactly this mechanism that many indigenous colleagues in Canada have indicted as epistemic violence and prime example of the persistence in this day and age of structures of colonialism. It resonates with these kind of insights across disciplinary boundaries that when Professor Seigel opined that comparison serves as a better subject than method, she also diagnosed the theoretical imperative. The charge to illuminate the complex global network of power inflected relations that enmesh our world, including those connections generated by academic engagement and observation. The way we compare and compared in the past is an elemental part of how such connections are generated. Awareness of the historical dynamics of comparison is instrumental in treating it as a subject. But it might be equally important for reclaiming it as a method. And ultimately for coming to terms with what comparative might mean as a label that historically has defined our respective disciplines. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Helga. Uh, next up, we've got um, uh, Cheryl Munchie. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to share my screen. I hope that works. Do, do you see it? Yeah, okay, super. Um, all right, well, thank you. Um, first to Maximo for inviting me. Thank you to the other panelists. It's really a privilege to be here and join all of you in this conversation, particularly at this moment when the stakes of comparative thought and historical memory have been made especially vivid in scenes like this, in which protesters around the world, motivated by the most recent spectacle of state violence against Black Americans, have focused their anger against symbols of white supremacy, forcing a reckoning with repressed histories of slavery and colonialism. These demonstrations and the transnational movements that they have galvanized are very much about history and its representation and contested meaning, and they've, and they've also been stimulated by acts of comparison, as Black and Brown people across the post-colonial world recognize in the experience of one another a common set of grievances rooted in histories of colonial capitalism. The toppling of statues uh, that we've seen this summer, of course, began in 2015 with the campaign to remove the statue of Cecil Rhodes from the University of Cape Town. For the students there, the statue of Rhodes who gifted his wealth to, the universe, to universities and foundations for the express purpose of expanding British imperialism, the statue represented the university's complicity, not just with the material legacies of empire, but its intellectual and epistemic complicity. The campaign we know quickly spread to other universities across South Africa, a Nigerian law student brought the campaign to Oxford, which finally promised to remove its offending roads only this summer. And of course, since then, statues of enslavers and colonizers have been removed from campuses and public spaces around the globe. And we should acknowledge that white supremacists and white nationalists have also engaged in acts of comparison. And as Helga just, just um, um, mentioned, colonists too. 
So Dylan Roof, for instance, the young man who entered a black church in South Carolina and knelt in prayer before killing nine parishioners had been wearing a jacket with a flag sewn into it, not the Confederate flag, but the flag of apartheid South Africa. And he called his website on which he published his, his racist manifesto, The Last Rhodesian. And James Whitman, of course, traces borrowings of white supremacists in the early 20th century um, across national contexts as well. So in my remarks, I wanna suggest that comparative law as a method, as a discipline, as a subfield has an important role to play in the legal academy at this historical moment. A discipline long devoted to challenging the methodological nationalism of legal study, which Helga just spoke about. Comparative law is also a natural site from which we might challenge the legal foundations of global white supremacy to explore the colonial roots of the contemporary nation state form and international system of nation states and to understand race as a global formation shaped by the imperatives of colonial capitalism. Before I say a little bit about my own work, um, I wanna say a little bit about my relationship to legal history and comparative law as disciplines. Um, though my research is focused on immigration and specifically histories of racialized exclusion from the United States, I'm not really trained as a historian, but historians, of course, do not hold a monopoly over the past or its meaning. And like many of us who are interested in exploring questions about race, we often find ourselves looking to the past to understand, to defamiliarize, and to, de to denaturalize the appearance or formulation of race in the present. Um, and our relationship to the past is not always identical with that of um, disciplined historians who rely on the availability of records, the authority of certain texts. Race scholarship is often in tension with the constraints of history as a, as a discipline. Consider the work, for instance, of Saidia Hartman, who confronting the poverty of the legal archive, attempts to reconstruct the lives of black women uh, who appear in official records only as articles of sale by engaging in what she calls critical fabulation or a kind of speculative supplementation. My relationship to comparative law is quirky too in that I'm not exactly steeped in the law of another country, nor does my research engage in comparison across national context. Instead, my interest in comparative law is shaped by my training in another comparative discipline, which is comparative literature. Comparative literature shares with comparative law an epistemic interest in defamiliarizing the givenness of national forms, as well as a certain ethical orientation that is um, an inclination towards difference and otherness. But the comparative and comparative literature differs from the comparative and comparative law in ways that I think are generative for comparative law. So, Early in the uh, 20th century, with the help of Rene Wellett, comparative literature as a discipline freed itself from the business of comparison, among other reasons, because it thought it had already made its case, right, in showing that national cultures do not exist in isolation, but within a tangle of, of relations. And he suggested that literature, studying literature in comparison was no more valuable than studying literature in general, or as he says here, no more valuable than studying anything else that you want. Um, and since the 1960s, the discipline has further freed itself from studying not just literature in general, but now discourse or the production of knowledge in general. Um, open to and enlivened by its engagement with various kinds of critical thought, post-structuralism, deconstruction, feminism and psychoanalysis, post-colonialism, new historicism, comparative literature as a discipline took a turn away from the study of natu national cultures to becoming a site of interdisciplinary critical self-reflection and methodological innovation for the university, a place from which to challenge both received knowledge uh, uh, and the conventions of knowledge production. And these intellectual movements were themselves shaped by the social movements of the 1960s and 70s, decolonization movements in Asia and Africa, anti-racist movements in the United States, and again, these students and activists were engaged in acts of comparison, comparative thought. Again, looking beyond national context to identify common source of grievance and histories of slavery and colonialism. And I mention all of this because this sort of expansive comparativism informs my own research and because I wanna argue that comparative law has a similar role to play in deprovincializing and decolonizing legal thought. My longing for comparative law is that it might become for the legal academy what comparative literature has become or was <laughs> for the university, a home for intellectual in, uh, exiles, a site for critical self-reflection, interdisciplinary exploration, and most importantly, a site from which to critically interrogate the received ideas and epistemic conventions that have been shaped by, remain complicit in the reproduction of global white supremacy and the structures of colonial capitalism. 
So in my own research on immigration, uh, history and comparativism enter my work in this sort of way. And it's essentially to displace the nation state frame and to revisit questions of immigration law from within an expanded framework of empire. Um, and let me explain a little bit by, by turning to two, two recent projects. So until the late 19th century, there were relatively few restrictions on mass migration to the new world. Settler colonialism was of course sustained by mass migration, the voluntary migration of European settlers, as well as the involuntary or forced migration of enslaved Africans, coolie laborers, criminal convicts, to say nothing yet of the forced displacement, dispossession, expulsion, and elimination of millions of indigenous people. But after centuries of mass movement, again, under the auspices of, of, of um, European empire states, it was the voluntary migration of a few thousand Asian immigrants to the settler new world that gave rise to modern immigration controls. In the United States, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1862 was the first federal law to substantially restrict mass migration. And of course it did so on an explicitly racial basis. And my own work has focused on the exclusion of Indian immigrants from the US in the early 20th century, a history that sometimes escapes contemporary notice because unlike the Chinese, Indians were excluded without the adoption of such a crudely racist bar. Exclusionists in Congress had proposed passing something like a Hindu exclusion act modeled after the Chinese act, but they were prevented for doing so among other reasons because Indians were subjects of a British empire and as such guaranteed the same rights uh, to travel as other British subjects. And exclusionists were also constrained by a growing global challenge to white supremacy. So kind of shift in public norms around explicitly racist discourse. And that, that challenge was sort of energized by Japan's emergence as a global military power challenging Anglo-American uh, hegemony in the Pacific and the de decolonizing movements of Asia and Africa. So this meant that exclusionists in the US could no longer pass such a crudely racist ban without provoking international controversy. So in 1917, Indians were eventually excluded by what was called the Asiatic Barred Zone Act, which was intended to exclude Indians, um, not, you know, carefully avoiding some others, but without ex explicitly naming Indians, right? Without sort of appearing to be a kind of race, racist bar. So following this history has led me to think more critically about the nation state frame, again, which stabilizes so much legal thought and, and immigration discourse, um, and in two, two ways. First, this history reveals a shift in the ground for immigrant exclusion, at least within the United States, from racialized bodies to a place of origin, naturalizing a relationship between peoples and place, essentially nationality. And so while the exclusion of peoples on the basis of racial identity is no longer tolerable within a post-colonial, post-civil rights ethos, the exclusion of people on the basis of geographic origin or again nationality is entirely normative. And we can recognize this, for instance, in the trajectory of the Muslim ban, right? When it looked like a racial ban, when Trump was saying Muslim, oh, I can't say the word Muslim, it provoked outrage. But when it was reformulated as a nationality ban, or as Trump helpfully explained, I'm talking territory instead of Muslim, um, then it was eventually held, upheld by the Supreme Court. So the peculiar status of, so that's, that's one, one lesson drawn from that study. Second, the peculiar status of Indian immigrants traveling as subjects of the British empire also helped me think beyond the familiar framework of the nation state and to resituate the question of immigration restriction within a broader imperial formation within the context of overlapping empires. And so while the United States was experimenting with excluding uh, Indians, it was doing so in correspondence and collaboration with other white, net, white settler nations, Canada, Australia, and South Africa. But in making the comparison between the United States and Canada, for instance, I'm interested in not just showing similarities and differences across national contexts, but the way in which the, the um, post-colonial nation state itself, formulations of a right to exclude are being defined across a white settler context through the experience of Asian exclusion. So in a new project, I'm continuing to explore some of these continuities between imperial expansion and immigrant exclusion, but by focusing on the US Southern border. Um, the Southern border, of course, is the effect of colonial invasion and expansion. It was drawn and redrawn over the course of centuries to define not just territorial boundaries, but to create dem a, a demographic boundaries. And in that sense, the border represents um, not an already existing divide, instead it produces the differences that it governs. As Josie Saldana has put it, the border has created 
essentially a non-indigenous white nation space atop of an indigenous um, space. So the Southern, that's, I think the divide in the American imaginary, right? Between a white civilized nation and the kind of looming threat of um, <laughs> erosion. The, the Southern border also has a temporal dimension in that it cleaves the colonial past from the national present. And with, uh, within an American constitutional tradition, this is significant because, significant because the colonial past and colonial dimensions of state power are often placed as beyond the frame of justiciability or or redress. Finally, the border also obscures another set of international relations, and that is the relation between indigenous nations and settler colonial states, right? Um, there are a number of nations here that straddle the same, same line. So the, the project began with Trump's border wall for me, um, a border wall that would run through the ancestral lands of the Tohono O'odham Nation, which has straddled the US-Mexico border since 1854, Otham land was divided after the Mexican-American War when the United States seized two thirds of Mexico. And initially this division did little to disturb Otham life, but over the course of the 20th century, the tribe has gradually lost territory on both sides of the border to encroachment, mining and railroad construction. And in the past few years, the reservation has become a site of both intensified border enforcement and unauthorized crossing. So for centuries, the Otham have relied on movement, a freedom of movement as a strategy for political and ecological survival. And the proposed wall only represents now the most recent violation in a long unbroken history of colonial invasion. So how does Otham persistence and presence challenge us to reframe and to reimagine the terms of a contemporary border debate? Um, among other things, the Otham remind us that there's nothing natural or inevitable about the nation state's contemporary borders, nor is there anything natural or inevitable about the United States or any other nation's assertion of a unilateral right to control the movement of others. So the Otham claim a freedom of movement that is especially compelling to me because it is prior to outside of the nation state and exercised independently of, of state dispensation. In the past decade, repressive border policies have also occasioned express, expressions of solidarity between indigenous people and unauthorized immigrants. For instance, last year, after the Trump administration announced plans to open a child detention center at um, Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, a practice, by the way, child detention has, that has disproportionately killed indigenous children, um, indigenous activists led a protest to block access to the site drawing connections between um, current child detention practices and their own histories of, of confinement and family separation. Fort Sill was opened as a military base 150 years ago to house American soldiers fighting Indians. In 1894, it was used to, uh, to imprison nearly 400 Apache men, women, and children who had been resisting colonization. It was closed for a time during the 20th century, but reopened uh, uh, during, the Second World War and used as a Japanese internment camp. Last year, survivors of Japanese internment joined indigenous and immigrant activists in protesting the reopening of the camp, identifying it as a site of continuous violence used to contain and suppress perceived threats to the settler nation. Satsuma Ina, a 75-year-old uh, survivor of, of internment explained when she joined the protest, we are here to protest the repetition of history. Thank you. Um, okay, well, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Shirley. Uh, next up is Tamar Herzog. Yes, thank you. Thank you also for, for the invitation. I am, um, uh, what I thought to say is, is quite different from what my previous, the previous panelists have, have discussed. Um, anyway, I feel at any rate a bit like an interloper because though I have a, an article in, on native customary law forthcoming in the Journal for Comparative Legal History, I really know very little about comparative law. As a result, after I got this invitation, I did what polite interlopers often do, or at least should do, which is read as much as I can, which is what I did time permitting in the last uh, few weeks. As was inevitable, I came across the 2017 debate in the American Journal of Comparative Law involving the text by Pierre Legrand and the answer of various scholars, among them those who share the panel with me today. 
Um, the debate was certainly heated and rightly so, as serious questions were asked and serious answers were given. But in the 15 minutes or so at my disposal, I do not want to engage with what was said. Instead, and as the organizers of this panel suggested that we establish a conversation between comparative law and legal history, I wish to ask how considering the past would have changed what was argued. So I want to introduce the past into this conversation. And I'd like to suggest two ways by which it could. So let me turn first to the first. The first would be with regard to the question, what is law? Is law a, an atemporal, a historical constant? Or what does law mean? And therefore what we should consider as such changes over time. With this question, I do not refer to the obvious fact that how you define a crime or what makes for valid will changes. Of course they do. I do not even refer to the cultural changes more generally. Instead, my question really focuses on the law itself. What should be included in this category, the law? In other words, can law itself be discussed in the abstract as if it was the same social phenomena always, or must we consider change over time? In my contention would be that what we mean by law may differ from place to place. It truly differs according to who's watching, but it definitely also differs according to time. Let me explain uh, what I mean. As a historian of late medieval and early modern Europe and its colonies, I have long sought to accustom myself to a legal universe that was substantially different than our own. Not only because specific solutions were different, but because the basic assumption regarding what law is, how it operates, the relationship it has with other normative and cultural sphere was, were vastly distinct. The law I study, so late medieval and early modern law, did not dictate solutions. This is one example. Instead, it indicated what should be asked and which considerations should be taken into account. It did not prescribe the end result because it was clear to contemporaries that the only possible answer would be justice. And what it meant in each particular case could not be spelled up out a priori. What law did therefore was to aid in taking a just decision by advancing options, explaining variation, imagining results. In other words, law was a system in which a variety of options coexisted, as well as a multiplicity of sources and authorities, all of which were equally valid and none clearly superior to the other. It was up to the user to decide which one was appropriate in which case. Of course, this statement would require further explanation, find a distinction regarding how it plays out differently in different places and over time. But my intention here is just to show the importance of not only charting legal solution, but also explaining the legal context in which they operated. That is not only specific solution changed over time, but also expectations as to the type of work law would do for us and how it would pretend to intervene in society. This, I think, matters to understanding the past, but it can also and must matter for understanding the present and therefore for doing comparisons. If change over time could contribute to the debate by problematizing what is the law, it can also contribute, and this is my second point, by reconsidering the units of comparison. That is by adding to the question, what is law? The question, whose law? The debate as I read it posited that comparison could be done between national laws, Western and non-Western law, state law and the legal experience of minorities, diasporas of no and networks. But what makes for a valid and meaningful unit of comparison? And how does this change over time? How do the units themselves emerge and change as well as acted upon by contemporaries? And should we care? So let me give you a few examples, and I'm very glad Shirley spoke about her own work because I'm going to introduce you my own. So I recently wrote on debates taking place in Europe regarding the question whether local law was of Germanic or Romanic origin. We may laugh at this question today, who cares, right? But it was incredibly important for some Europeans and it can be traced all the way from the 16th to the 20th century and I'm probably being unjust because it probably like everything else began before. Notably, notable intellectuals in France, England, Germany, Spain, to name just a few example, deeply cared to answer this question. Regardless of the question why, which I cannot answer here, but you're welcome to look at my text. 
uh, what these debates clarified to me that in Europe it was, and perhaps still is, possible to ask questions about legal affiliation. Rather than affirming the existence of a French or a Spanish law, it was, and perhaps it still is, possible to imagine a Germanic and a Romanic law that cross boundaries united with separate Europeans into two rather than multiple legal regimes. Should we care such was the case in the past? Are these ways of organizing legal experience per se, dead, irrelevant? Or should we consider them because they would allow us to imagine different units of comparisons even today? If some questioned their true belongings, others were certain about what they were not. I recently read a wonderful monograph on late 19th and a uh, discussion regarding citizenship and belonging. For complicated reason, again, I cannot explain here, one of the discussants who acted as the expert of Muslim law stated the following, Sharia is not Roman law. Was this surprising? Yes and no. The speaker certainly felt very strongly, this is the end of the 19th century, that the two systems were utterly distinct, even opposing. Yet we do know that historians have long debated whether such was the case and to what a degree. So regardless of who was right and who's wrong, it is thus evident that it is possible for some to think of Sharia and Roman law as two clearly distinct system, while others would argue that at least in the beginning, they were not. But is it that easy to escape the unit that seems so natural to us? And how can we do that? Let me end with one last example. In 2010, I published a monograph on the history of European law. It's titled A Short History of European Law, The Last Two and a Half Millennia. This was the result of decades of teaching European legal history to both historians and jurists, both in Europe and the United States. Clearly, I had plenty of ideas, perhaps even convictions, regarding how such a book uh, should be written and what it needed to accomplish. Among other things, I wanted to show that it was possible to write a history of law in Europe which would not be divided by countries or regions. Rather than law in Italy, law in Germany, law in France, or even a comparative legal analysis, I wanted to form a narrative that without ignoring variation could nonetheless tell a story that would be pan-European. I thus searched in my own work, my cover work, in my publication, as well as in the writing of many, many, many others, indication for similar processes across much of the continent. Some were easy to detect. For example, how Europeans of different areas in different times dealt with the question of customary law. I'm not saying that they dealt with it similarly, but they battled with the question and asked similar question, not necessarily leading to the same conclusion. Where I really got stuck was on how to write English law into my narrative of a common Europe. I knew I wanted to accomplish that. I was convinced I was right. But how was I to show that English law in fact participated in a common European historical trajectory? The solution I adopted was to use a single narrative for Europe in antiquity and the high middle ages, yet beginning in the 11th and 12th century, alternate between chapters focused on England and chapters that discuss the continent, itself a really strange unit, the continent. Though separated, my aim was to showcase the strong parallelism. I thus narrated in alternating chapters, the emergence of the, in the 12th and 13th century of a European use commune, and an English common law. I then moved to examine also in alternate chapters how they each were questioned in the 16th, 17th century, revolutionized in the 18th century, and codified or not in the 19th century. I was quite happy with this result until an astute observer, a student in a workshop as often happens, remarked that despite my wish to showcase interconnectedness and entanglement, I basically repeated the, the well-known story that stressed distinctions. My chapter on the birth of use commune in Europe insisted on the importance of university. My chapter in English in England focused on the birth of common law. Though in later chapters, I asserted that debates of universi in universities were not completely distinctive in the sense that they mostly resulted not in the creation of a new law, but in the reformulation of existing law and that common law was only one of multiple many legal system operating in England, still I did not truly separate myself from the traditional divide that juxtaposed a continental to an English law 
and, and English law that despite my own strong objection, even I ended up describing mostly by referencing common law. The student asked me why. He also challenged me to think how my narrative would have changed had I broken these preconceived, perhaps intuitive legal units, continental versus common law, that we may take so much for granted and instead adopt a narrative that would be more faithful to the past and would make sense in the long durée. Yes, I thought to myself, this would have been an interesting exercise. I could have easily done that. Instead of alternating between use commune and common law, I could have chosen to compare English to continental law with the aim of decentering common law as I wish to do, asserting its relative marginality within the English system before the 17th century. Or even better, I could have asked question rather than affirm the existence of a common versus continental law by taking, for example, as my unit of analysis, not English versus continental, but feudal law or customary law or ecclesiastical law on both sides of the ownership channel. Would proceeding in this way be doing an irreparable, irreparable violence to the common law, as some have argued? Or would it enable us to engage seriously with the fascinating question of whether European law should be divided and characterized according to what it had become rather than what it had historically been? So by asking questions about how conceptions of law, law itself change over time, and how the separation into units historically emerged, hopefully we will remember that understanding the pluralities of the past is a necessary step also for imagining the pluralities of the present and the possibilities of the future. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, uh, Tamar. And uh, now, uh, last but not least, Jim Whitman. I'm pretty sure least, actually, but I'll... <laughs> I'll try to put on a good show. Anyway, um, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to join my fellow panelists on the panel and a real pity not to be able to hang out at lunch or something afterwards. What can we all do? Uh, we're online, but maybe there'll be a chance in the future. Um, uh, I, before launching into what I plan to say myself, I hope I can comment a little bit on what the previous speakers have said in one particular respect, because I think that Tamar has just made a very important observation which can be treated as a, as a response of a kind to what to Helga's initial comments. What Tamar says is absolutely right. One of the striking things about our understanding of law and comparative law is how much it has revolved since the 19th century and indeed possibly since the 16th century around the contrast between Roman and Germanic traditions or something like that. That remained very much true in the 19th century. Why does that matter? It matters because even in the high era of nationalism, it's quite striking how much comparative law managed to organize its thinking around a different set of non-nationalistic categories. That seems to me something worth emphasizing in the history of our field. Really, it stands out in that particular respect. That's not to deny, particularly in comparative legislation, which, which Helga also mentioned, that there were nationalistic trends in comparative law. Nevertheless, it's quite remarkable how much comparative law resisted to the extent it did, the nationalistic tendency that was so present in all of uh, all of the other fields of the time. Um, it's, so it seems to me anyway, perhaps we can discuss that, that more. Uh, but let me go on to what I had thought of saying. I don't know if I'll even fill 15 minutes. I think it's important to begin with uh, a statement of principle with which I think my fellow panelists might agree. I hope they would agree. In asking the question how comparative law relates to legal history, it's important to say that there is no such thing as the methodology of comparative law. Our question cannot be how comparative law ought to be done. Uh, there is no single way of doing comparative law and perhaps it's worth comparing comparative law with some of the, the other subjects taught in the law schools in order to emphasize the point if we were talking about property, for example, we would all assume that there is a truth about property law or something like that. And for that reason, we would all be committed to the proposition that there must be a methodology for understanding property. We might disagree about whether it were economic analysis or something else, but we would believe that there's an ultimate answer to be given about, about property. There is no truth about comparative law. There is no ultimate answer. And for that reason, there can't be any discussion of what the proper methodology of comparative law is. It may be coming back to Helga's comments uh, that comparative law seem to have uh, a single topic seem to be pursuing a single truth, namely how the advanced legal traditions related to the non-advanced legal traditions circa 1900 or something. And in, in that era, perhaps it would have made sense 
to ask, what is the proper methodology of comparative law for resolving that single great question? But there is no single great question. Comparative law is an inexhaustible set of topics involving in one way or another different traditions. And the task of comparative law is not to answer the ultimate question of comparative law, but to say something interesting and useful. And there is no shortage of ways of saying something interesting or useful. And perhaps the first thing to say about the relationship between legal history and comparative law is that when it's done well, it can be very, very interesting. And that's in the last analysis, maybe the most important thing we can ask of the, of the subject that it produced articles people want to read, books that people want to read, books that in some ways seem illuminating about, about the world. Um, for that reason, like the other panelists, when I talk about the relationship between comparative law and legal history, I'm just gonna suggest a couple of subjects that seem to me interesting, approaches that have seemed to me interesting in my own work and that might be interesting in future work too. And, and here I'll just toss out two possibilities about how we might think about the relationship between the two fields, uh, vaguely drawing inspiration from the people who do uh, literature in law schools and who distinguish law as literature and law and literature. Maybe the comparison doesn't really fly, but I thought I'd throw it anyway. They, 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 were about, they, they worry about these kinds of questions too. Let me start with the usefulness of legal history in doing the hermeneutic interpretive work of comparative law. Now here, I'll, again, there are no, there's no single answer in comparative law, but in much of my work, I've started from the assumption, which I think must be shared by many of the now 103 attendees or something like that, that, that the first difficulty in doing comparative law is understanding the mentality of participants in a foreign, let's call it alien, alien is a better term, alien legal tradition. Uh, using, by the way, Patrick Glenn's term tradition here. Uh, the real difficulty is getting into the heads of them other people. Understanding what their unspoken assumptions are, understanding how their view of the world, often again, without any full self-awareness, differs from our view of the world. And there, I think, understanding history or uh, digging into the legal history of different traditions is often the royal road to understanding the, the foreign culture. Uh, it's not the only one, no doubt, um, but in doing my own work. So for example, I've written about comparative law of privacy. It's essential to understand how European understandings or continental European understandings of privacy differ from common law understandings of privacy and especially American understandings of, understandings of privacy in making the effort to grasp the differences, call them cultural differences. Um, I have found it for my own purposes, most useful to work through the history of how the concepts of property develop, how they became incorporated into the law and these various traditions. Useful for me, I think also useful in presenting the material to readers. The problem in comparative, the, the great problem that, that we can to that extent address through using legal history is the problem famously first stated by Herder. It's the problem of Einfühlung. How do we feel our way into the other system? The history can help us feel our way in. Uh, and, you know, I, but again, the test of, let me just say, when I say that, I don't mean that the correct way to feel one's way into the uh, alien tradition is to understand the history of the alien tradition. I don't know whether that's true. I have found this uh, methodological approach valuable for my purposes, but it may very well not be the only way of doing things. And, and I don't mean to say that it is. The task, once again, is to write what seem interesting and illuminating studies in comparative law uh, and not to state the correct approach to comparative law, because I don't think there is one. I really don't think there is one. Um, but to the extent our, our, our task, our challenge is the challenge of understanding, the legal history can be useful in solving that problem. That's one use of legal history that I wanted to suggest. Another very different one is to ask how different legal traditions, what are differently oriented toward history? A different kind of question. This is a question of classification of legal traditions. And, and, and here what I'd like to suggest is that there are in fact differences. Uh, easily identifiable differences, uh, provocatively striking differences between different legal traditions. There are, to begin with, legal traditions which 
display a certain orientation toward their history that we see very notably in Sharia, since, since Tamar mentioned it, or in American constitutional law and maybe, maybe American law more broadly. Uh, perhaps we can also see it in French law. These are traditions which, whose self-understanding starts from the proposition that uh, the tradition itself had a founding moment to which the tradition must remain faithful. This is very obviously true in the case of Islamic law. I think it's very obviously true in the case of American constitutional law and maybe American constitutional law more broadly, uh, just as one asks what lessons can be learned from the prophet and the prophet's companions in Islamic law. We look to the founders all the time in the United States. It's not at all obvious why any legal tradition would do that. In fact, it's, I, I speak not of Islam, but of American law. In American law, it's rank nonsense. But the legitimacy of the legal system seems to depend on that attitude toward the history of the tradition. Uh, once again, I think we can say something similar, although others might disagree, about the attitude of French law toward the Republic and the revolutionary tradition. One must remain faithful to the tradition of the Republic in France, whatever that, whatever that might mean. And of course, what the dictates of the tradition are, are uh, uh, entirely indeterminate in all of these traditions. The point is not that they in fact, that Islam in fact reflects, well, I, again, I shouldn't speak of Islamic law, I'm not an expert on it. The point is not that what we do in American law authentically reflects what the founders intended. It's just that the, the legitimacy of the law seems to depend on our ability to make reference to what the founders intended, uh, the founders and their companions, again, as you might say, uh, 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 somewhat jocularly uh, about American law. Other systems very clearly reflect different attitudes toward the, his the history of the system itself. Uh, now, again, we'll have to work this out much more carefully than I've done, and I haven't come here with a developed argument about all of this, uh, but I think that we're in the presence of an important classificatory difference in, in, in legal systems. One way to speak about the classificatory difference is to, to bow in the direction of the greatest of comparative lawyers, Max Weber, and say that we see something like traditional authority in the American system, something like traditional authority in the American system or in, or in the tradition of Islamic law, whereas we see something more like legal rational authority at work in, say, German law now. That's not to say that German law doesn't reflect an understanding of German history. Of course it does, but I'm, gonna, I'm going to maintain without having proven the point that the attitude is different from the attitude that we find in, in American law in that respect. Uh, well, again, we could go on, I could go on at much greater length about this. And in fact, I should have done enough work to be able to go on at greater length about it. All that I really wanna do for purposes of discussion here is to suggest that legal history or at least history when we pose that question, plays a different, but quite an important role in our understanding of comparative law. Different legal traditions display different attitudes toward history. Some of them, like the American legal tradition, very noticeably to speak in terms of the philosophy of history or maybe the French tradition, uh, seem to reflect a linear attitude towards history, that history has a starting point and it's moving toward an ultimate conclusion. To the extent our understanding of the legitimacy of the law and how we resolve particular legal problems reflects that idea. The legal system as we see in the United States, or in, and again, maybe the French tradition, uh, bears a relationship to the religious traditions we associate with uh, Christianity, for example. Also Christianity often said to reflect a linear notion of history in which is a beginning point and in which the world is moving toward its ultimate, ultimate conclusion. If we can really identify those parallels, I think we may be able to say something quite important about how a system like the American system organizes itself and how it differs from other legal systems. So I offer those as two ways. And again, these are not intended as uh, an account of the correct ways of thinking about the relationship between legal history and, and comparative law, but as two ways of thinking historically, using history and talking about, about comparative law. And I'll, I'll just stop there.
Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Jim. Uh, now it's time we have some time for uh, uh, questions and comments from uh, from all participants. Um, it looks like we actually have two ways of uh, uh, asking questions. You can use the, the chat function or you can use the Q&A button right next to the chat function. It looks like the two the two are interchangeable and then I will I will try to um, uh, read the, the what your questions or comments to the, the panelists. So we'll start with um, we have a uh, a question in the chat from uh, Mortimer Sellers uh, for all panelists uh, who asks, to what extent can we see comparative law and legal history as two possible vehicles for the improvement of our own current and existing legal institutions by making it possible to evaluate them from the outside, seeing, things, seeing how things could be done differently and perhaps better? Uh, parentheses, with comparisons to our own legal history being perhaps even more powerful because it is different, even alien, but still a part of our own tradition. That's a question for uh, for for any or all of the of the panelists. I'm happy to begin. But yeah. Um, I can say um, recently I had to explain why I love doing history. And my explanation was precisely going in this direction that for me, history is a way to first uh, think about the complexities of the past and therefore also necessarily the complexities of the present and the future. But I really also have a sense that it is all about understanding that nothing is foretold and nothing is necessary. Um, history we, as historians, we cannot responsibly say what would have happened if, but we trace the moments of decision making in the past. We trace the possibilities that existed, even if we don't follow all of them. And I think if we had that plurality of options in mind that we once had, we will have it in the future too. So I think for me, history, to summarize, is a deposit of possibilities, of solutions, of roads not taken, not only of roads taken, that would enrich our understanding also of the present and of the future. I think it's a place for a lot of things we dislike, but it also a lot of inspiration for things that could have happened and possibilities that uh, were possible. <laughs> Anyone else? I'll try to, if I may. I mean, I. I I see it is, I'm not quite sure what Tim had in mind, but it's certainly possible in comparative law to think one has found better solutions in another, in another tradition. German law often produces extremely fine solutions. If you ask me, for example, that doesn't mean that they can necessarily be imported to countries outside Germany, but still um, one does sometimes think one is finding better solutions. But my experience of history is that what was done in the past really looks better really looks better. Mostly one finds, <laughs> looks at the history of a doctrine or the history of a tradition and says, and learns how inapplicable the doctrine of the tradition is to the way we do things now. So, so if the question is, can we learn from history? I kind of think no, at least not in the narrow sense that we're looking for technical solutions uh, to things in modern law. Uh, Shirley or Helga, would you like to, to respond? I like the question, I'll say, and, and I guess what I was trying to suggest is that I think comparative law can be about alterity, right? Which I think offers a lot of value for the study of, of law, especially in the American context. It feels like there's a lot of resistance sometimes to sort of recognizing and opening up law and its complexity. And so if that alterity takes the form of history or comparison um, across national context, that, that's, that's valuable. And I think we can also recognize other forms of alterity that may be useful. And it might be sort of recognizing the authority of um, historically repressed societies who aren't always um, honored within, you know, as authority figures of authority within um, within a historical discipline or within the legal context. And, and so I think um, proliferating sources of authority from within, from, wi from, from which to make sense of law and um, its alternatives, you know, is, is valuable as part of this, the work of comparative, comparative study. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you very much for the question, uh, Tim. Uh, I think that's, of course, a question that you receive a lot, I think, as a comparatist and as a historian. And I think uh, both are uh, 
uh, often a bit tired of, of uh, being asked to, to instrumentalize their, their field of study, right? Is, is the presence of history in the, in the curriculum only justifiable through some, some concrete instrumental use? And of course you could say, yes, we, we, we can't learn directly from the doctrinal solutions of the past, but of course we can learn to a certain degree how things went awry and how we uh, avoid mistakes. And of course, uh, at the moment, in, in is a lot of our minds how, how history possibly repeats itself. Um, but I, I often or, or mostly tend to say that uh, such uh, uh, conclusions from the past are, are, are difficult because of the complexity of, of, of historical processes and also of the dynamics of comparison. I think um, there have always been different kinds of comparative law and different forms of legal history, intellectual legal history, social legal history, and so on. And if we now combine all this, there is a, a broad array of, of approaches. And as uh, 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 Jim said, it's, it's not, there is not one methodology here. And of course, there is still um, very, um, uh, very important uh, for 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 legislative purposes a, a view um, towards uh, 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 historical developments, but also across the borders in order to to avoid mistakes. There's there's where there is a very practical use for for comparative law, but I think the the, the broader scholarly called scholarly engagement uh, um, with as Shirella said, with alterity, with otherness, that is the main lesson and the main potential of both subjects, just because our, uh, our curriculum at the law schools, uh, even if we try to be more transnational and progressive, we're still, as an academic discipline, more than others parochial and uh, still caught in our national frameworks. And in this, these disciplines that kind of open up our view and our students view towards relativity, right? And I think that is the, 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 the biggest uh, value that uh, teaching and scholarly engagement with these, with these subjects had not concrete institutional improvement, but actually, you know, teaching generations of, of, of young lawyers to be a bit more open-minded. And that is something that already has come to fruition over the last decades. And uh, I think that should be uh, an aspect not to be forgotten. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Our, our next question comes from uh, uh, Joshua Carton who says, I was interested to hear the comments from more than one panelist about nationalism and comparative law. Does a focus on legal traditions or legal families efface nationalism or is it just an alternative to nationalism that still divides an us from a them? For example, can't it be used to recapitulate older patterns of dividing developed from undeveloped or civilized from uncivilized legal systems? To bring this question into relief, what does the history of traditionalism or familyism, as opposed to nationalism in comparative law teach us about the more recent turn to transnationalism in comparative law? That's a, that's a question for everyone. I'll, I'll try. I mean, gosh, everything is organi organized around us and them. So our choices among different varieties of us and them. <laughs> uh, maybe that's too dark and schmitty in a way of viewing the world. I'm not sure. But uh, you know, the real question is: is 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 the family understanding of things, uh, of of uh, family organization of the world into us and them, better or worse than the nationalistic organization of the world into us and them? And that's one we could just debate, I suppose. I mean, what does deserve emphasizing, I really think, coming back to my earlier comments, is that particularly in the spread of the civil law tradition, there is a really deep-rooted transnational uh, uh, history within, within comparative law um, that deserves emphasis. I mean, that is, it is quite striking how unnationalistic uh, despite the national characteristics, ca characteristics we can point to, how, how unnationalistic the history of the spread of the civil law tradition in Japan is, for example. I mean, it's not the only thing that went on in Japan in the late 19th century, but it's still really quite remarkable. Um, or Turkey would be another example as well. And, uh, you know, maybe this also, maybe this, this uh, 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 can be condemned as part of a d developmentalist or something like that attitude toward the world and 
carrying its own us and themness with it, and maybe it should be, but it is different from nationalism. That's 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 all that I would want to emphasize. Yeah. Um, Go ahead, Hilda. Uh, I, can, I can try as well. So. Um, if I understand uh, Josh's question correctly, then he expresses that replacing nationalism with different units of comparison has uh, similarly dangerous implications and um, that this is just a different way of, again, drawing this dividing line between us and them. And um, uh, Jim just said, yes, of course, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's an ordering category that we find everywhere, but I, but I also find that um, this, this traditional macro comparative categories like the legal family or also the legal tradition to a certain degree, yes, indeed come itself and that connects to a little bit to what I've been saying and what I've been working, uh, working on recently, of course, also draws on this, this older legacy of um, organizing the, the us uh, and them around categories that also stem from the 19th century, that the legal families uh, uh, literature has drawn on previous sources that stem from the 19th century that have to do with the currency of the family image um, that comes from philology actually, and that in the 19th century is then closely tied to, to categories like, for example, race to Aryanism that are extremely problematic that are some of these, these um, this baggage somehow getting lost, of course, it's not being cited anymore, but we hang on to categories like the families that at least are, are way too, too, too rough to, to, to do justice to, um, you know, the subtleties that we encounter in, in regional differences and that, of course, are, uh, have the potential to reinforce also stereotypes and then indeed uh, seem to return in, in, in law and development scholarship in the, in the 60s and 70s. So absolutely, I, I do share this reservation towards these broad categories and We've, um, we've mentioned the name of Patrick Glenn, who've tried to come back to this kind of macro comparative scholarship and rethink it by coming up with a more flexible, more porous, less border uh, uh, entrenching way of defining tradition. But, but of course, even there we, we find difficulties when he's trying to just group together indigenous laws from, from all over the globe, just together by very broad uh, 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 categories that are of course, if you look at them closely, are um, uh, very problematic. So coming to transnationalism, I think the, the real potential of transnationalism is to, to refuse to compare and to really say, instead of accepting that they are static entities that even can be compared, we are just focusing primarily on the, the dynamic um, processes in between the kind of the interstitial, the de deteriorized. So that's something that um, transnationalism tries to do. Whether it can live up to that and that replace comparison, I don't think that comparison is replaceable just because it's such a um, visceral way of, of engaging with otherness. So we will have to find a, a kind of enlightened fusing, merging of, of both methodologies, I think. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead, Tamar. So again, thinking a, a bit to what I've said, I think the interesting thing would be to remember that whatever unit we adopt, and I do agree with uh, Jim somehow, that comparison always involves both fic fictional sim fictional similarities and fictional differences. And they're very often fictional, but it doesn't matter. They're just as powerful. But I think what... Uh, history can do is first show us that they emerge and change over time, precisely that these units are not natural, they're not obvious, they're not statics, they change all the time. But I think looking through different degree of units also makes us see the plurality of these processes, it isn't just national versus international, it's family versus family, it's city versus city, it's, uh, I don't know, region versus region, it's mountain versus plains, it's yeah. national versus... That is, if we think about the plurality of the units that are out there and in which we or others arranged us, then it makes it much more interesting. And I think that could be the contribution of comparative law precisely. 
if you didn't take for granted, there's only one unit, whether it's the nation or trans, it doesn't matter. Uh, but in, instead hovered between dif different levels and whether you could think about the historicity of all these concepts and how they change over time, then, um, then it would be us and them, but it would be an us and them that makes much more sense to me somehow. Sorelli, do you want to respond? Um, I, I think a lot has been said. The only thing I'll just add in direct response to the question is that um, in my own thinking, especially around immigration, um, the turn to comparison allows us to sort of defamiliarize the nation state form and the nation state frame and explore um, the way in which something like immigration kind of con you know, conditions its emergence and its articulation. Um, that's one thing. And then the second thing I guess I want to say with respect to this us and them thing, you know, part of what I'm interested in tracing also is the way in which the nation state form um, and the nation and nationalism appears as um, an acceptable form <laughs> of doing us and them in the wake of a kind of like anti-racism of the you know, mid 20th century. Um, you see that especially in the immigration context. Okay, thanks. Um, our next question is from uh, John uh, Reitz, who says, uh, several of you have quite justly emphasized the enduring impacts of the sorry history of colonialism, oppression, and exclusion. But in order to learn about the others, with a capital O, don't we have to start with our own categories and concepts? But if that is true, how can we best engage in comparison that is not imperialist? And again, that's a, that's a question for everyone. I mean, I have thought, I have a thought about that. Um, I mean, one, one, um, one thought again is to sort of, um, is to sort of like deprive and destitute the existing kind of settler colonial nation state form in this, in this context of its, of its exclusive authority over a question like this, right? And to sort of recognize the authority um, and the, you know, the, the authority of historically excluded and marginalized figures, right? And so I mentioned the work of Saidiya Hartman, but there are plenty of historians who have been interested in sort of recovering, producing a kind of like repository of, al of alternative futures, of alternative presence by um, recalling kind of like the resistant agency of these, of these, um, of, of these other groups, right? And so I think um, to me, part of the value of looking below the nation state frame, outside of the nation state frame is that it sort of um, produces and recovers these alternative sources of possibility, um, alternative imaginaries. And also, um, you know, part of what, you know, when I'm showing these pictures of, of student activists who are engaged in the third world liberation movement, they're working outside of the nation state frame. They're imagining kind of post-colonial futures that are not determined by, you know, the, the, that escape are genuinely kind of outside um, of, of the structures of, of imperial um, architecture, legal architecture and, and, and thought. That's a provisional answer. Anyone else? I'm, I'm willing to, to say something too. So I think uh, uh, one aspect of, of, of thinking about colonialism is always uh, precisely what we, we heard from uh, Shirley, um, thinking about how to give place, legitimacy, power, voice to these other groups. But I think there is another part that we're completely overlooking as we're doing that, which is thinking about the effect of colonialism on the colonized. And uh, this is a, the kind of uh, things that, you know, I started, um, still am a, also historian of Spain and Portugal, um, of the legal history of Spain and Portugal, this was clearly part of the debate, right? We always cite famous Bartolomé de las Casas speaking about the plight of American Indians. If you read Bartolomé de las Casas, he was really, really, really concerned with what he will do to Spaniards. He's talking about the end of the world. He's talking about Spaniards losing their human sense. So I know that in the past we have done that work or to some degree or some countries have done this work. But honestly, I think as, as legal scholars, it is time to return to this question too. If we're visiting the 
the damage, the role, the, the domination that was done to, the domin to those who suffered. I think it is also time to think about how it shaped our current uh, culture. In my sense, even in the debate that currently happens in the US, we're really not looking at that, what, uh, how it distorted the institutions of the dominating society as well. And for me, that will be a really inter interesting point, not only because it happened, but it would involve people who don't think they're involved, who think it's the problem of other people, those who suffered and not their own, it will have them acquire a better understanding of how it, it is also their own because it has influenced them in certain ways. So with, I'm, I'm very sympathetic to everything that was said, but I'd love to see also a very strong current of self, you know, kind of reflection. And I think comparative history could do that. I mean, how often, I know we always say we must, but how often did people really seriously engage with how law in Europe changed because of colonialism, for example? What kind of possibilities or how did it press, push European law in certain direction, but perhaps it wouldn't have gone? I mean, again, it's counter, we cannot write a counter history, but one could imagine the ways in which colonialism had affected also. I'd love to see that too, because then it would make it so much more relevant to people who think it's not you know, they might feel that they're outside this story. No, we're all in this story together. That's my own reading. Uh, Helga, did you want to respond? You got to unmute yourself. I'm sorry about that. Yes, I, I just wanted to follow up on that and say that exactly that's that exactly the kind of work that should precede. Um, you know, the work that the question asks for, this kind of uh, self-reflection uh, and uh, of course the unpleasant uh, uh, self-reflection that needs to be the basis of then kind of trying to better understand one's own biases and uh, the way that this entanglement and the impact of colonialism uh, indeed uh, persists, right, in, in, in this DNA and age, in our institutional setup, in the way that, that disciplines, in the way that uh, our ways of, of knowledge are categorized. Um, so all that is so pervasive that it really requires uh, a, lot of, a lot of work um, in order to engage then in the, in the next steps and to confront this, this, this bias. Um, we've seen this in, in anthropology, for example, a lot where work is preceded by, by long statements of self-reflection that tries to tease out one's, one's own bias as an observer or observer participant. Um, but of course, it is very difficult uh, to say that this would be then uh, uh, leading to a successful and decolonized engagement in, in comparison because it's such, such an ongoing process. And um, I have to say, it's, it's, I find it much more difficult to, to, to um, engage in this as a, as a practitioner of comparative law than, for example, as someone who, so who edits a, a, a journal, which I, which I happen to do on comparative law. I think the best thing one can do is maybe to, to, to sit back and just, just learn um, about uh, uh, other forms of scholarship that has done a lot of the work. And in, in, instead of just um, appropriating this, of course, to, to really, um, let others speak for a while. For in, in Canada, we have at the moment a really a historical movement of um, coming to terms with with the colonial history and the the uh, still existing structures of colonialism because Indigenous colleagues are now able to 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 voice this within the uh, uh, university institution from which they were previously in, uh, excluded and now slowly more and more voices are able to express themselves with, from within the accepted uh, western structures and and i feel that really it, it, it could be time to just let others speak for a while and as a, as an as an editor of of of, of, a, of a comparative law journal i've I've really tried to, 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 to give the voice to others and um, whether that you know, helps us as practitioners of comparative law as who we are uh, uh, um, with our own um, biases and perceptions, I, I hope so, but it's, um, it's not easy to answer your question, John. So uh, are we still on on the question? Yeah, go, go, go ahead, Jen, your turn. 
I'm, I'm a little I'm a little handicapped in answering because I'm not quite sure I understood John's initial question to tell you the truth. But but listening to my fellow panelists speak, I, I still think I have a thought. I mean, of course, yes, there's there's a, a history of colonialism and white supremacy which I've written about myself naturally. Um, and you can't, as a historical matter, can't understand the systems unless we know their origins in colonialism. So one example we might give, for example, um, is, is the uh, practice of, of capital markets, which begins uh, in particular in the process of financing first Portuguese expeditions to Africa, and then of course in Amsterdam and financing the uh, Dutch East India Company and, and, and comparable, com comparable enterprises in the uh, late 16th, early 17th century and through the 17th century. Um, so yeah, I mean, these things have a colonial history, but of course the natural question if we're being careful about it to ask is, so what? What difference does it make if the, our law of capital markets can be dated back to, to those colonial ventures? Why would we care? And I think we have to get, be more careful in giving an answer about why we might care. And the answer I would, I would be inclined to give comes back to, I think what we've been saying more broadly on the panel, which is that the, the normative legitimacy of the systems depends on their histories. That's why it's not because, and that's a particular form of analysis of comparative law and a particular use of, of, of legal history, once again, is to recognize the ultimate issue is, is an issue not really about the supposed uh, or the possible viciousness of these institutions because of their origin, the origin of an institution doesn't, doesn't give rise to that kind of viciousness. It has to do instead with the larger sense of the legitimacy of the legal system. Uh, now, you know, and, and, and it, one can observe looking at the current political state of affairs in the law that the legitimacy of these systems is for some people, probably for a small minority, many of them in academia, but for some people, the legitimacy of the systems is deeply undermined by their historic connection to, 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 the, to the history of colonialism and, and white supremacy, but that's the way the point has to be framed, it seems to me. Okay. Uh, thanks, Jim. Uh, we, we started a little late, so let's go for till um, uh, 50 minutes after the hour. And it looks like we have a question from Intasar Rab who asks, trotting, uh, trot, trotting out the debates on citations of foreign law and specifically where comparative law meets originalism, as in recent decisions and dissents on the death penalty and legal injection, which the, so, lethal injection, which the Supreme Court has determined will only violate the Eighth Amendment of the US Constitution if contrary to evolving standards of decency, is there something comparative law and legal history can add to guide the debate? What history and which countries count even persuasively? That's a question for everyone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no one, no one. I mean, I'll try. We we can look to other countries, but the underlying assumption would be kind of a the the, the kind of assumption Helga was announcing before, namely that there is a, a a collective process of progress toward the more advanced state of the law, or something like that, and that since it can be observed that many, but not all, but many OECD countries have eliminated the death penalty, why then the U.S. looks like a backward country since it hasn't done that. Now that's of course the form of argument that people typically offer, but I think that Helga began by denouncing that form of argument in, in comparative law, so maybe it can't be made. <laughs> Helga, did you want to say something? Oh, I think um, I would like to leave the concrete answer to this question to the to the American colleagues, but uh, um, denouncing the hope for progress, that's something I wouldn't want to do in this generality. What I was, uh, what I was trying to refer to was a very concrete belief in progress in a very concrete historical context of, uh, of philosophies uh, of uh, history in the Hegelian way that really saw humanity and civilization develop towards a certain uh, a certain state um, that um, 
strangely res resemble a lot uh, uh, the Prussian <laughs> way of organizing things. And of course, then um, the more uh, science, biology, zoology, uh, uh, genetics driven um, uh, uh, strain of this kind of thinking. So uh, evolution, Darwin, but from Spencer in the social realm. So that is something that I think we can, we can all agree uh, is a matter of the past that we all have some some idealism left and hope that uh, certain things improve that I did not mean to denounce. <laughs> I hope it didn't come across that way. <laughs> okay, yeah, Tamar? I, I may be a cynic, but I think when the court speaks like that, it imagines that there is a very, um, that there are sources out there that would be legitimate to show and I think these sources in the mind of the law of the court is are quite limited. Uh, but of course, it's all a matter of justification, right? So uh, the court would normally take the sources that would give its decision the greatest authority possible. In the world of all goods, it will be from many traditions and many places to show it's universal. In our current situation, it's not going to be. But I think it all goes back not so much to what is useful, but really to the issue that Jim had brought uh, so strongly in several of his responses of justification and the kind of uh, the ability to, to show that you're right. I was speaking, um, I'm quite obsessed with this idea that we have in a certain moment in modernity of self-evident truth. Um, I find it an incredible, incredible, incredible argument. And I don't know how people came up with such a crazy idea of what it means, but regardless, I think that's the horizon in which they operate, only that their self-evident truth might not be really self-general or generally true. <laughs> but anyway, I think it's all about that kind of legitimization that comes without real proof, because the question isn't really real proof. The question is conviction. But I'm a cynic, so apologies. Shrali, did you want to respond? No? OK. And, and uh, so I think we have time for uh, one last question from Maximo. OK, thank you, everyone, for the fascinating panel. Um, Jim said uh, in his presentation, um, the task of comparative law is saying something interesting and useful. Uh, but I guess my question is, to what extent that way of defining the task of comparative law and maybe of legal history or history addresses the type of critiques that Sherali and Helge have articulated, right? I mean, one way to understand this is that there should be, let's say, an ethics of comparison, right? That uh, looks at or thinks about or is fully aware of the possible effects, right? Uh, that the way we do comparative law may reproduce, right? Uh, existing uh, problematic structures of power, right? Global structures of power uh, or problematic ideas of race, right? Or, or gender or whatever it is. So I guess uh, my question is, is there a, a, an ethics uh, of comparative law, right? Or is there an ethics that comparative should, you know, in, uh, use, right, or, or, or be part of what they are doing, and is there an ethics of legal history, of history, and if Kelly and Sherari think that this in some way will address, right, the, 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 their critiques, right, and their perspectives, or uh, it's actually not a good way or an insufficient way to capture a part of what they are saying. Um, well, I mean, since I was mentioned, I'll just say, I, if, if Helga and Charlie are, are, are right, the yeah. ethics they're prescribing is not just an ethics for comparative law, it's a, an ethics for everything we do in the university. So I, I don't think that it bears particularly on the problems of comparative law. I mean, it may be true that we must all, all, all remember these, these, this collective history, but that's true for everybody. That's not just true for us. So I, I don't think it's a point about comparative law at all. And to that extent, I mean, Charlie, do you want to go first? Uh, I guess, it, I guess what I try to convey is that I think that comparative law um, can be a really important corrective to legal study in the U.S. as usual, 
right? Um, and in that sense, it can be a site of sort of, you know, deprovincializing, defamiliarizing, um, you know, a, a tradition that doesn't often get sort of interrogated on other terms, right? There's a kind of sometimes, there's a, there's a hostility, I think, sometimes within um, legal scholarship and, and, and American legal classrooms towards kind of critique. And so I think comparative, comparative law has an important, important role to play in that respect. And I'm just, you know, listening to this question about, I, I think there should be room to write, to write um, things that are, you know, interesting and, and useful. And I think comparative law, you know, comparative law can be the site for that within, within law schools. But um, thinking about Guy through Spivak, who kind of writes, a lot of her writing about, about comparative literature turns to pedagogy, right? And she sort of like preserves comparative literature as this site for thinking, right? In a kind of like Arendtian sense, but a thinking that is, that she distinguishes from training. Um, and I think, again, there's, there's a role that comparativism in this expansive form, right, can play within, within um, a, you know, law schools, legal institutions that are, that are so singularly devoted to um, the business of training, which is really about the kind of reproduction, uh, you know, re which is committed to a kind of social reproduction, but also a kind of a reproduction of, of institutions and forms. And so I, I, I'm committed to the idea of preserving a kind of, of, you know, comparativism that is, you know, apart from the language of ethics, at least sort of an irritant <laughs> to, that, to that kind of like task of social reproduction. Yeah, um, I, if I if I may add to that, um, ethics. At first, I was a little um, taken aback by the choice of words. I think because the first association I had with that is an almost political agenda that we are supposed to do comparative law in a specific way and. In that vein, as, as Jim said, basically everything we do uh, has to follow a, social, so, uh, so a certain um, ethical imperative. Uh, I, I wouldn't agree with that, but if we understand ethical as ethical as being used for us as researchers when we apply for grants and to describe our, our, our projects, that we have to follow certain standards of, of ethics as researchers um, in the sense of uh, uh, being, being honest and genuine about the, 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 the methods that we're using. I think then this et ethical obligation as a researcher in this field or in any other field, that is not maybe an exact science that involves an individual factor more strongly than in other fields maybe. Uh, in the humanities and in, in, in law and in history that we owe ourselves and uh, uh, the scholarly community uh, a, a reflection on our own bias and our own um, being caught in certain structures that need to be reflected upon. And in that sense, I would say, yes, absolutely. There, there is an ethics because it's a, it's a, it's a manner or the matter of, of proper methodology. And although there is not one methodology of comparative law or in law, of course, I think what all the methodologies share is this um, ethical component of being able to be transparent about your methods and um, you know, including the necessary self-reflection. Tamar, did you want to respond? Okay, well, I think we've I think we've hit an end. Thanks, thanks very much to uh, to our panelists, and thanks to uh, the people who uh, asked such great questions. Maximo, did you want to have any closing remarks? Uh, just simply thank uh, thank uh, all the panelists for that that excellent uh, panel, and, and also Stuart, and uh, remind everyone that now in a, you know one 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 ten uh, Eastern time, right? Ten 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 uh, Pacific Standard Time, right? In in just 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is, we have a, a block of, of concurrent panels, okay? So I encourage everyone uh, to attend and to look at uh, our program for uh, the later uh, events of the day. So simply that, and thank you everyone uh, for- Thanks, thanks hey, to all thanks of you. So that was great, thank you. Thank you.